Thank you, Mally. <clears throat> Good morning. Please join me as we uh, continue with our scripture lessons. The first from Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. And this can be found on page 503. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts, who knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them, and they are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. We continue with our gospel lesson from the book of John, chapter 1 verses 43 through 51, and that can be found on page 862. <clears throat> the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. He is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, He is truly an Israelite, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered, do you believe this because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Before I begin, I just want to say how excited I am to be here. Uh, and being halfway through the service, I just it's a special day that I, with the special music and being able to share a love feast that I already feel well fed and not just from the food. To be here and to share and to have an opportunity to um, talk about missions, something very dear to my heart, and to be able to share it with all of you who are also here to share and worship our God and Savior together is really a blessing for me. Will you please join me in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come together, to share your name, and to share uh, with each other a simple meal and a love feast, but so much more than that. All of the things that you ask of us, Lord, the tasks that you give us, we know that we can do when we come together to go out and share your word. Lord, as we today think about missions, we think about the history, the present, and the future of the message that you give us that has lasted since the beginning of time, Lord, in your Son, who was the Word, and became flesh, and became our Savior. Please, Lord, help us to know what our call is, and what gifts you have given us to go out in your name. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. So once again, good morning. My name is Justin Rabach, and I am the Director of Mission Engagement for the Board of World Mission of the Moravian Church in North America. So some background, which some of you likely already know, the Board of World Mission is made up of representatives from the Northern Province, Southern Province, and Alaska <laughs> Province of the Moravian Church. Twice a year, these elected representatives come together to help direct the work of <clears throat> the board and the staff and support our work, the staff of which I am a part. To back up a little bit and give some perspective, this morning, this message is being given in a church in the Southern Province of the Moravian Church in North America and the southern province being one of 22 Moravian Unity provinces around the world. In addition to those 22 Unity provinces, there are 16 mission areas, six mission provinces, and two Unity undertakings. <laughs> In all of those different pieces and parts combined, there are more than 1.3 million Moravians around the world. Of those 1.3 million, to give a little bit more perspective, 
Less than 1% live here in the southern province. I say all of that to get to this point. We're not alone in this journey. Having world in the name, the Board of World Mission might be best known for the work that we do around the world. And certainly, the Board of World Mission is a primary avenue through which our congregations in the northern and southern provinces and Alaskan provinces connect with churches and ministries around the world. We do this through relationships with the partner provinces as well. And a partner province is a relationship between two provinces that are covenants to work together in mission and in ministry. It's a relationship of support and of encouragement and of discipleship. Partner provinces of the Moravian Church in North America include the churches in Costa Rica, Eastern and West Indies, Guyana, Honduras, Labrador, Nicaragua, and Western Tanzania. We also have responsibilities with three newer work areas called mission areas in Sierra Leone, Cuba, and Peru. And so while this non-exhaustive list of the work we do around the world may seem a bit exhausting in and of itself, it's not all that the Board of World Mission does. We also look to be a resource to members and congregations here in the provinces that make up the Board of World Mission. Through the Moravian Volunteer Resources Program and Moravian Disaster Response, we're always eager to help connect people's gifts and passions with the needs and, uh, that are apparent both at home and around the world. We've sent more than 40 individuals to 10 different countries through the Antioch program. We're available to work with congregations to help do trainings for teams going out in mission or to help a congregation or an individual figure out just what mission it might be being called to in its own community. If you are feeling a call to mission, to set out on that journey, the Border World Mission wants you to know that we're here to walk with you and that we want to journey together. At the same time, just as the Board of World Mission wants to journey together with you where you are feeling called, we're also asking you to join with us on the missions and ministries that we are engaged in collectively. We need your prayerful support for the church and medical work in Honduras as it undergoes drastic transitions. We need your financial support to be able to help our partners in Peru and Cuba expand their amazing ministry. We need you to volunteer as you feel led to take part in teams or as an individual to those who are going to places like Chicago, Mississippi, Pennsylvania, Nepal, the Czech Republic, and that's just in the next few months, and other places around the world. Please come to us. Let us know your gifts and passions, and let us help you discern your call. So to this point, you're thinking that my sermon may sound more like a little bit of a commercial for the Board of World Mission uh, than a sermon itself. I may say that you're not completely off. As a commercial, maybe you take a small amount of time, usually 30 seconds to a minute, and try to get some people to be excited about a product or experience that you cannot possibly live without. Well, I am grateful in that uh, regard to have an opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, I may take a bit longer than 30 seconds if you'll grant me so much, but to be able to star in this sermon commercial for missions this morning. So I may have commercials on my mind considering the Super Bowl is coming soon. Uh, and usually the commercials take up quite a bit of the news cycle of, of this thing as well. Uh, interesting to me, though, is that on the Monday morning after the Super Bowl, the talk usually is not about uh, what product may have actually been best that was advertised, but rather about the commercial itself. It's about the celebrity spokesperson or like the jokes that were in the piece, who appeared in the ad, and, and not about whether that thing being advertised is actually worth investing time or money on. So you have companies spending countless hours, millions of dollars, for just 30 seconds, for a minute, and trying to find a message that lasts. So now a year removed from last year's Super Bowl, I guess I have a question for you all. Can you remember a Super Bowl ad that was last year and what product it was for? As I was trying to, as I was writing this and thinking about it, I could only remember one commercial that I was sure was last year and the product it was for. And to be truthful, I have an emotional attachment to anything with puppies in it. So that was the one commercial that I can remember. But so now I talk, I, I am going somewhere with this talk of commercials. Um, and to cut to the point, my, my point is this. The church should not try and be Taco Bell. If you're wondering what that means, Taco Bell is famous for its commercials. And if you watch the Super Bowl this year, you're sure to see some ads from that company. So while some of the Taco Bell commercials over time have stuck in my head, there's also one with a puppy in that as well, uh, they also have become just a bit of a joke to me. 
often as I look at those things, I say, how many times can you take the same six ingredients, wrap them in some new way, and try and just plead with me to come in and say, try this new thing that we have going on? Because no matter how many times you bring this commercial to me, when I come in and actually take a bite of this taco, I'm not going to forget that what you promised as these wonderful ingredients and things are actually filler and not maybe so fresh in themselves. So more than $100 million was spent by Taco Bell last year, cutting costs uh, by serving less than fresh products and paying their workers relatively low wages. They still invested this amount of money into advertising to try and find their message that lasts. So sticking with this theme, let me tell you a little different way. So Chipotle, another restaurant, similar genre, does things a little differently. They rely on quality products and delivering a simple selection. They don't rely on TV commercials to attract customers to explain to them the new thing happening each and every week. Their marketing strategy, taken from the website, is that it's based on the belief that the best and most recognizable brands aren't built through advertising or promotional campaigns alone, but rather through all of the ways that people experience their product i.e. they make sure that they have good food. This model has been working well as Chipotle, this restaurant chain, is growing by leaps and bounds. And they're doing it while prioritizing paying their workers a living wage and serving fresh, locally grown produce. No TV commercials, and yet people still come. Because they like the, how the work is being done, and more importantly, when people know, they know they will leave well fed. So now that I've gotten to the concept of being well-fed, you maybe can see how uh, thinking about commercials in relation to the church and how this kind of ties in with our gospel lesson today from the book of John. You see, it's, it's the goal of the church as well to make sure that people are well-fed. Time and again in scriptures, we see Christ's call for us to love those around us and to do this by making sure that people are fed. Fed spiritually, fed emotionally, and fed physically. This is our job, and this is our promise, and this is how we know that our customers, I mean members and mission partners, are satisfied. So as Christians and as a church, we stand at a crossroads. We have a decision of what, how to make and where we will invest, where to invest our time, our money, and how we will find and share our own message, which lasts. You see, I'm here to talk about missions today and really Missions is our opportunity to advertise the work that we are doing in the world. We have, for a lack of a better term in this analogy, a product in Jesus Christ that we wholeheartedly believe in and endorse, and we simply believe that others cannot live without. So we're back to commercials. Do we as a church take our mission budget and buy a billboard or make flyers or celebrity spokesperson? Do we try and explain the whole gospel in 30 seconds? You may know my response to some of these questions as I once again repeat my warning that the church should not be Taco Bell. I'm here today as a speaker and the spokesperson, if you will, in a time of transition, a day when we celebrate the long and faithful, loving ministry that makes up the Mission Band's more than 100-year history. And part of that celebration now entails looking forward to something new. One of the reasons I'm here today is because I am the youngest and newest staff member of the Board of World Mission, and ostensibly might have a little bit of energy or passion to share on the subject of missions. Well, I hope in this regard that it does shine through that this is something that means a whole lot to me, and that I do have a tremendous amount of energy for this work. However, it's not just because I am young. It's because I have experienced the life to the full that Jesus promises us in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10. It's because I have been well-fed by my church, the loving community who helped raise and engage me in this mission. It is for these reasons that I've helped invested my time, my life, my career, and my vocation into this, into this thing that I simply cannot live without. So I don't stand before you to put a younger face on missions, to stress the importance of a good Facebook page to talk about your mission and to reach out in your ministry, or to plead with you to reach out and engage a generation of millennials Young people becoming increasingly uh, engaged in service and volunteer work, but often outside of the church and outside of the faith context. Yes, we must be willing to adapt to the times and find relevant ways of ministering to the world around us. But we cannot try and win people with fancy messages or pleading with them to come see just the new thing that we have going on. We can't be Taco Bell. And we don't have to be. 
We already have a message that lasts. We have a message that has lasted from Jesus read today more than 2,000 years later. Rather, are we as a church ready to reinvest ourselves in God's mission? Are we ready to continually to be about the work of feeding people spiritually, emotionally, and physically? Are we ready to deplete our advertising budget or those things so much that when someone asks us for information about our church or our ministry, we don't have a hand up, but we simply say, come and see what we are about? Are we in a place where we do not feel we need to try and out-argue someone into understanding why we believe or do what we do, but instead often an inv- offer an invitation of come and see? So I pause for just a moment to clarify that I don't think brochures or informational materials about a church are wrong. Rather, ask you to think deeply about, if is there anyone even here who came to the church only because of those things? My guess would be that there's a deeper connection, a follow-up, a personal invitation, an experience that you have had and that people need to have with our Lord Jesus Christ that lead them in and keep them and have them engage in this mission as a part of the congregation. In our gospel lesson today, we read about how Nathaniel became a disciple. Verses 45 through 51, 43 through 51 of chapter 1 of the book of John are the ending section depicting the calling of the disciples. First was Andrew and Peter, and then Philip, and then Nathaniel. And this is where we pick up our story. Philip has quickly answered Jesus' call to say, direct invitation to come and follow me. So Philip quickly goes to his friend Nathaniel and says, We found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Nazareth. Now Nazareth can't, Nathaniel can't believe it, saying, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? So now this is where Philip must make his decision. His decision not to be like Taco Bell. It's where our decision comes in now in those same moments of we're trying to tell someone, Come and see, we have found this thing that you cannot live without. Philip had his friend's attention. He could have used, tried to persuade him with fancy words or reviews online of other disciples who thought Jesus was really great and Jesus was the Messiah, but rather his response was, come and see. Intrigued enough by the simple phrase to follow Philip, when he arrives, Nathaniel is convinced that Christ is indeed the Messiah. Again, not by fancy arguments or flashy commercials, but rather by Jesus saying that he saw him under the fig tree before Philip found him. One commentary on the passage I read uh, said that the fig tree, so it has more leafy branches, you think kind of like an oak tree, and is a place of shade and often can represent a place where people go for meditation and prayer uh, and relaxation. And so it's possible when Jesus said that he saw Nathaniel under this fig tree, that it's Jesus saying, I heard your prayers. I heard your deepest desire of your heart to know and love the long-promised Messiah. So it's this simple phrase, the simple act that gets Nathaniel to give up everything and follow Christ. And for this decision, Christ promises that he will see greater and greater things because of his choice. Jesus promises that he will be well fed. So do we see the examples we must take from this lesson as we move forward in mission? It's not the big things that we need to worry about first. We aren't going to grow a new mission movement or everyone in in 30 seconds with a large buy one mission trip, get one free special, or even an early bird Easter sunrise special. Rather, it's possible it'll be the things that we don't even know we're doing which have the greatest impact and the greatest outreach of all. It may be that when people come and see the church in action, they'll be blown away by the deep examples of faith, hope, and love that reflect our relationship with our God. We just can't talk about, for lack of a better word again, our product, Jesus Christ. We have to bring people to him. Some things you just have to see and experience for yourself. As I think about uh, history and and the new things that are going on, I have to share a few examples um, and lessons that I've learned as I've had opportunities to speak. Salem, North Carolina. You can worship with us live online at homemoravian.org where you'll also find a copy of the worship bulletin. Copies of the Moravian Book of Worship are available online at store.moravian.org. We invite you to worship with us in person or join us for fellowship and other activities. For more information about Home Moravian, please call the church office during regular weekday hours or visit our website at homemoravian.org. 
And please join us again each Sunday at 10 a.m. for an hour of worship from Home Moravian Church. invitation that has been passed on. It is something that you are able to engage in and take part and live life to the full that you've been invited into. And your role now is to say, invite others into that as well, to come to me, not to see you, not to see the things that you're able to do, but me. Bring him people here. I was reminded once again of this as well as I was up in <clears throat> Canada and one of the amazing things about being able to do this is the number of homes and places and as we talk about family, knowing people everywhere. Uh, I was invited into a home as I was going to talk about missions up in Canada and hanging on the wall in this woman's home who I had never met before was a quilt that had been made in 1902 at my home congregation, Ebenezer Moravian Church. They had sold and made pinwheels and embroidered the names of families. You could donate a quarter or five cents for your own name, quarter for the family, have it embroidered on there and the, don't, the funds went to missions. Sure enough, there was my great-grandfather's family and my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles all in a pinwheel as well. Again, it's not something new, and it's not even something new within my family that we were taking part in. As a final story, uh, my second, or I guess second trip back to Nicaragua, I had been just touched by this area when I had a chance to go. It was my first real international mission experience. And when I came back and brought along some of my peers who I invited to say, come and see, see, these things that I'm so passionate and excited about and I just can't fully describe. Uh, I got in the truck as we got picked up from the airport and a person now who has become a very good friend in Nicaragua just stopped before we moved, looked at me and said, I never thought that you would come and see us again. It's about that deep connection, those commitments, these things of saying it's not just about the invitation but the follow-up, the pieces that we are inviting people into. It's something deeper. We face a world of people whose deepest desire is to connect with their God, and whether they know it or not. There are people praying and seeking to be made whole, to find the thing that their souls hunger for. As you search for the mission that God <clears throat> has for you individually and as a community of faith, I encourage you to invest yourselves fully into service and a life that reflects uh, your faith. And I could talk for hours and not be able to fully describe the depth of the experiences I've had when taking part in missions or service opportunities. As the Director of Mission Engagement for the Board of World Mission, I'm happy to meet with you and encourage you and talk about the opportunities we have, the resources that are available, but there's no stronger invitation that I can make than to simply say, if you're interested in mission, come and see. If you want to know why missions uh, is something that I care so much about, Something that actually today is my wife's birthday and agreed to be here and with her blessing to come and speak about missions today. Something that could draw me here for that on this occasion and come and see. If you want to know why people give up vacation, donate money, and volunteer to do something totally for the benefit of others, come and see. If you want to take part in missions through your words, through your actions, you must be willing to bring people to Christ so they can experience him. You have to be ready to invite any and all to come and see. Amen.